All right, in your Bible and out of Psalm 51, Psalm 51. Brother Steve, our brother that's been coming on Sunday evening, I announced this morning concerning his son. He was telling me a while ago that he's not much better and the next 24 hours is going to be critical. So please, if you will, keep him in your prayers. And then some of you that uh, were here in the 90s, you'll remember Brother Ray Thompson, one of our directors at BIMI. And he is in the hospital in Erlanger in Chattanooga. He's in a coma also, very ill, and it's a situation that uh, they're not sure that he'll recover. So please pray for both of these and uh, pray that the Lord will be with them and encourage their heart. And uh, one day we'll be all together in heaven, won't we? And what a great thing that will be. But we say goodbye many times to those that we love and those that we've known for years. Brother Roy Ackerley was one of my professors at Temple. And then I got to meet him, and we found, got to be very good friends, and I've had him here many times. He's gone to be with the Lord. And I remember these guys, and I appreciate them so much. Hindering revival. What hinders revival? I think revival is very important to the child of God. Revive us again, the Bible says. And we certainly from time to time need Revival. I want you to read Psalm 51 with me again tonight because David is backslidden. He's in great need of uh, refreshing. He is in great need of getting right with the Lord. One of the great men in the Old Testament, David, but a man that had his ups and downs. And of course, um, he's had an affair with a woman. And uh, he's out of touch with the Lord, out of fellowship with him. And uh, that's a dangerous thing, by the way. That's a dangerous thing, to be in a uh, sin-sick relationship in many different ways. Because there's danger in continuing in that and then going to heaven prematurely. And so David is now seeking reconciliation. He wants to get right with the Lord. He wants to get this sin to be taken away. Watch what he says now as we read these verses again in Psalm 51, going down through the entire chapter. Of course, you know the story now, don't you? You know, know the story. And Nathan comes to David after giving the story about the little ewe lamb. And Nathan says to David, you're the man. Can you imagine what went through his mind and heart when he was confronted with the fact you're the man. And so now he's seeking God's mercy. Now let me pause. The next few days, the next few months, the next year or so, will you be seeking God's mercy? Will I? Remember, we have an old nature. Satan knows that. I've, I've said it over and over again. We cannot emphasize that enough. And you and I could be involved in some serious sin if we're not careful. The Bible tells us about that. Be careful. Watching. Be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about, seeking whom he may devour. Now David's been confronted with his sin. Now he's seeking mercy. Now watch what he says. You read this with me this morning. But watch what he says in verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. Aren't you glad that word loving kindness is in the Bible? In connection with God? Do you realize this is God? the creator of the universe. He just spoke it into existence. Took dirt and created you and I. Breathed into our nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And now David's talking to this God and he wants forgiveness. He wants to seek God's loving kindness according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Now watch this. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. Here's the problem with us many times. 
We ask for forgiveness, but we hold on. We hold on. We ask for forgiveness. And the Lord gives it, but we want to hold on. Well, maybe I want to do that again. That's human nature. But David says, uh, I want you to wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. Now watch this statement. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Now actually he had sinned against Bathsheba. He had sinned against those that he knew, those in his close relationship. He had sinned against the people of God. And he's crying out now. Now verse 5. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Now I love this verse. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Did you know that only God can create a clean heart in you and me? Let me ask you this question, parents. What if your son or daughter comes to you one day and announces that they've been involved in a hideous sin? You'd want them to confess and be forgiven, wouldn't you? You would want that. You'd want that for yourself. And so David now is understanding how important it is. And so he says again in verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Let me stop right there. When you and I have sin in our life, but we truly confess it, honestly, and we want to forsake it. Isn't this a great thought? He'll remember it no more. You will stand at the judgment seat of Christ. That sin won't even be brought up. It won't even be a thing that will bother you at the judgment seat. Isn't that great? Hallelujah, what a Savior. Amen? And I'm so glad he forgives. And will move us on and use us even after we blew it and blew it terribly. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Verse 9, hide thy face from my sins, blot out mine iniquities. Now here I love it. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. And behold me, and uh, uphold me with thy free spirit. Then I will teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. I've got to stop again. Once we confess our sins, and he blots out our sins and wipes them away, we are now fit to continue on. Now the devil will come to you. The devil will come to you and say, Hey, remember what you did? You know what you need to say? Take that up with the Lord. I'm going on. Hey, devil, take that up with the Lord. I'm going on. That's forgiven. Isn't that great? Amen. Hallelujah. And so he says, Then I'll teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners will be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood, blood guiltness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, of thy, my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thy lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praises. For thou desirest not sacrifice, or I would give it. If thou delightest not in the burnt offerings, the sacrifices of God, now listen to this, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. 
if we're going to have revival in our church, then the members of this church need to get down and do business with God. And I would pray that before we begin our revival, the majority of our church could say, God has created within me a contrite heart. And then, in verse 18, Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be praised with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings, with whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. The work of God will continue on and keep on going, and God will be able to bless. Now, you could read this psalm, and you could put a caption to it. How to get up when you're spiritually down. How to get up when you're spiritually down. Now... Once again, you guys are the Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night crowd. But once again, may I emphasize that makes you more of a target for Satan. Because you're here. And I hope that when you leave here, that you're witnessing and that you're giving out tracts and that you're praying. Now, stop for just a second. I want you to look at me. I need... I need your prayers. The last month, Satan has fought me, I think, more than he has ever fought me in a long time. And I'm not going to go into it. Now, no, I'm not falling into any sin or anything like that. It's just the fact that Satan, from the time I wake up of the morning and go through my day, there's those battles, those battles, those battles. Maybe in a way I've not known it before. I want you to pray for me. I need your prayers. And, of course, I pray for you. So we may get down spiritually, but we can get up. You see, David wanted here in this passage of Scripture cleansing in God's sight so that he could use him again. Now the Lord wants us to be cleansed in his sight so we can reach the world with the gospel. Reach this community with the gospel. Now, we're going to get involved in some things that we've not done before, taking out the gospel, going door to door, that everybody in here could get involved in, and it won't be a matter of, well, I'm, I'm too timid, I'm too backward. No, you can get the gospel out in these measures that we're going to use. Now, in my opinion, nothing beats just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, nothing beats just looking a man in the eyeball or a woman in the eyeball and say, do you know if you died today, you'd go to heaven? Let me show you how you can be saved. Now, most of the time you're going to get a, a negative remark probably in this day which we live, but God tells us, tells us to still do that. But there are other ways of doing it that, are, that's, that, that seems to be working. And so here is David. Uh, he's confessing his sin, and now he wants cleansing so God will use him again. Now, he appeals to God's compassion. He appeals to God's compassion. So what I'm saying to you and me tonight is this. Before our evangelist gets here on Saturday and before Sunday comes and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday gets here, let's get alone. Let's make sure that we're on our knees and that we're getting right with God. There's nothing that will keep us from having his blessing. So he appealed to the Lord's compassion in verse 1 and in verse 9. He's getting down to serious business with God. Wouldn't you if you had sinned like David? Can you imagine taking a man's wife, having his hus her husband killed? And this is a man after God's own heart. And so you know the whole gruesome story. And I'm certain that Satan put all kind of things in David's mind. Wouldn't you think? Well, you're done for now. King. Hey, King, you're done for now. By the way, the devil will tell you that. And me that. Well, you've sinned and it's done now. And I'm going to ask some more things before we go tonight. Uh, like I did this morning, if we have some of these things in our life, uh, we need to take care of them. Then we find David getting down to business, requesting mercy. Now, 
How long David went without repenting, I don't really know. But he did go a period of time without repenting. But all of that time, God was working. Thank God when the God works on a Christian's heart, they listen and get it taken care of. Amen. Because if you keep going and you're a Christian, the Lord will not stop. He will not stop. And so I'm trying to emphasize this. And so he wanted here in the passage a complete cleansing. He wanted to be able to be clean so he could step back in his position as king and serve God again, and God did use him. Aren't you glad of that? Aren't you glad of that? We quote 1 John 1, 9 over and over again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, that's a wonderful thing. So what David did is he acknowledged his corruption. He acknowledged it. He begged for God's mercy. And he was sincere. And then what did God do? He washed him from his sins, cleansed him, restored him into fellowship, and used him again. I love the song, Nothing Between My Soul and the Savior. Now, let me just run down in the next few moments, like I did this morning, some of the things that will hinder and destroy revival. And I'll just mention these. I'll not say a lot about it. Have we been gossiping about people? Have we been gossiping about people? Let's, let's, let's admit it. Men and women both love to talk. Now, ladies, do you know that you use at least two to 3,000 more words a day than we men do? Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that, but check it out. All right, you're going to get yourself in trouble, young man. You better watch it. You're going to get yourself in trouble. But whether you're a man or a woman, we use words, don't we? And sometimes those words are used for gossip and slander and all kind of things, and God hates that. God hates that. You see, when we slander the character of others, we could destroy them if we're not careful. And by the way, when you start gossiping, other people pick it up and they take it and they go and they take it and they go and they take it and they go. I, I, let me tell you the story. I love to tell it. I've, I've told it here many times, but you've heard it, but it, it, it just illustrates the little boy that was all the time getting in trouble by hurting people and calling them names and, and just all the time getting in trouble. And finally his dad said to him, I've had enough of this. I've had enough of it. And he said, every time that you hurt somebody, that you say something that you shouldn't say, and there's a post out there, and he said, I'm going to nail a nail in that post for every time that you use your tongue to talk about other people and hurt people. And it wasn't long until that post was completely filled with nails, completely. The little boy went out and looked at it, and he looked at that, and he thought, how awful that is. It finally dawned on him. And his dad said, okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. For every time you do something nice and you say something courteous about someone and you don't hurt somebody, we'll take a nail out. The day finally came that all the nails were taken out. And there it was. And the little boy dancing around the pole to be clean, clean. And the daddy said, son, stand back. Take a look. The nails are gone but the holes are still there. The nails are gone, but the holes are still there. Let's remember that. If we use our tongue to hurt and slander people, we might get forgiveness for it, but the hole is still there. And hurting people, you, do you like to be hurt? Do you like to be hurt? I don't. You know what my pastor told me? When I announced the call to preach, we went out the next day and went riding together. 
And he said, I want to give you some good advice. He said, you're a young man. But he said, I want to give you some good advice. Everybody's not going to love you. There are those that are going to hate you. There are those that will try to destroy you. There will be a whispering campaign. They'll tell you to your face how much they love you, and then they go home and they talk to their spouses and they talk in front of their kids. And he said, be ready for it. But he said, what you need to do, Bob, is try your best to live a godly life with God's help. And God will take care of that. God will take care of that. And do you know what happened not long after that? There was a family in the church that slandered him. But he did exactly what he said that I was to do. The church found out about it and the deacons dealt with it just like that. And these people were moved out of the church. And that's the right thing to do if people will not repent. So let's watch this matter of gossiping. What about criticizing? Harsh criticism. Now I don't mind criticism that builds up. Constructive criticism, that's one thing. But criticism that destroys, that's another thing. Do you like to be criticized? Well, no. None of us like to be criticized. But the devil knows the power of criticism, finding fault, looking for something to find fault. And I think that's a terrible thing. Do we rob God in tithes and offering, offerings? Do we rob God uh, when it comes to giving him our time? And we give a lot of time to different things, but he wants our time. Are we worldly? Are we worldly? I was listening to uh, John MacArthur this afternoon. Sue was getting a nap, and I was listening to John MacArthur, and he was making the statement and of course, if you know anything about John, he is a, a teacher. Large church out in California doing a tremendous job. And you know what he said? He said, as long as God is on his throne and I'm pastor here, we're not going to bring the world into the church just to appeal to the world. Now, you know what he's saying? There's nothing wrong with using new things new technology, new ways of doing things. Nothing wrong with that. But what I'm saying is taking the world's type of doing things into the church and that's what he's talking about. We need to stay away from worldliness. We want godliness, don't we? I'll just simply say that. Godliness, righteousness. And, and that's, that's what God would, would, would want. Are we worldly? Do we rob God? Do we harbor a spirit of bitterness toward others? We battle that, don't we? We battle that. Let's say that a little bird flies into your hearing and whispers something into your ear. It was true about someone belittling you, tearing you down. That would hurt, wouldn't it? That would hurt. But how would we respond and then would we turn around and harbor bitterness toward those people? All these are things that the devil can use. I know this is not a great theological exposition. It's just uh, talking about what goes on in a church, goes on in our lives. Um, have we wronged anyone and failed to make it right? Have we wronged anyone and failed to make it right? Now, don't be worried and anxious. The devil will use that. Worried and anxious. The devil wants us to be fearful. Fearful. Because if he can make us fearful, he knows that we'll not step out and serve God. We'll be too cautious. We won't get in the Word and hear what God uh, wants us to do. And so then we fail to trust God. By the way, we must trust God if this revival is going to be a success. He will bring success through our efforts if we'll follow the scriptures and follow what we've just read in the scriptures this morning uh, and this evening. So don't be worried and anxious. Trust God and have him uh, right at, in your heart and in your thinking. Now here's something that the devil uses. Unholy lustful thoughts. Unholy lustful thoughts. And it doesn't matter what age 
you're in, that can come to any age group of people. And the devil knows our weaknesses in that, doesn't he? Now wait, talk about David when he sinned with Bathsheba. The first thing is he should have been out on the battlefield. Right? The Bible says that his soldiers were out on the battlefield and he stayed at home. And because he stayed at home, the Bible says he saw a woman bathing, taking, washing herself. And then he called for her to come to him. Bad move, right? A very, very, very bad move. And so we need to be on guard at all times. These lustful thoughts will come to us and then he had to pay the price. Can you imagine the difference it would have made had David been on the battlefield? If he was on the battlefield, he'd have never known anything about this situation. He would have had the greater blessings, the greater power of God on his life. And when he gets to heaven, I think that he's going to be losing some rewards with the Lord because of that. And so don't waste your time, don't waste the Lord's time in letting these things destroy you. Are we true in our statements that we make? Are we guilty of the sin of unbelief? Do you believe God can give us a revival? i like to hear that amen. If you don't believe it, what makes you think God's going to give us a revival if we really don't think revival can come? Now, this young man's not going to bring a revival in his back pocket, obviously. But God can bring a revival through his preaching and through our prayers and through our getting out here and getting the gospel out. Then again, are we neglecting the word of God? Are we neglecting the Word of God? I suggested again and again and again, I suggest again, study this book systematically. Study it systematically. I've done that for years and years and years. I uh, picked up a couple of study Bibles. Of course, I've gone through the Schofield Reference Bible and some of the others several times, eight times. And so I've picked up some other study Bibles, and what I'm doing now is I've went back to the book of Genesis chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 1. I'll read the chapter and try to get something out of the chapter on my own, and then I'll go down to the notes and look at those notes and compare what I've written down with those notes, and then go over to Matthew chapter 1 and do the same. Then I go to the next chapter, the next chapter, and the next chapter. You know what I've done? After going through the study of the Bible eight times in all of these years, I'm going through it again. Now I'm finding things I hadn't even seen before. But that's this book. Amen? There's no book like this book. Don't neglect the Word of God. And then the last thing. Have you and I been confessing Christ openly? Have we been confessing Him openly? And I'll close with this. I was an only child and lived on a farm and uh, I was just bashful. I mean just bashful. I was terrified to go to school. All those kids, uh, you know, and uh, so forth and so on. And so when I got called to preach and I answered the call to preach, uh, my pastor took me out soul winning. Boy, that was really good when he was with me and he was doing the witnessing. But then that day came that we was walking up the door and he turned to me and said, Now you're up. It's yours now. What? What? I was literally scared to death. 18, 19 years old, I was scared to death. And boy, did I blow it. I, I, did I blow it. But I learned that if you'll ask God to give you a burden for souls, a burden for the lost, so that, wouldn't think about this now. I believe this with all of my heart. You know, when we get to heaven, we're going to be gathered with our love circle. I love that. Isn't that wonderful? We're going to be gathered to our love circle. I think about that at night. I want to see my grandpas. I never, never had a relationship with them down here. My uh, grandpa Bob, I never, uh, I, I met him once, but I was only like four years old, something like that. And my grandpa Will, I never met him. He died before uh, I was born. 
uh, great Christian man. My mother said he was one of the best Christians she had ever known. And uh, from what I hear, he was. I can't wait to see them. But now, wait a minute. I think about this. I want to see the people I've led to the Lord. Don't you want to see the people that you've led to the Lord? I don't know how all that's going to work out. But after we've been there for whatever time and we've met up we've been our, with our family and having a great time and so forth and then we get to meet those that we either have led to the Lord or we had a part in their salvation. Don't you think there might be a few shouting, little shouting going on? A little happiness, a little joy, hugging one another and be with one another forever. Forever and ever. Now I don't know how it'll work I've pastored several churches, but I can't wait to see all those folks that I've had the pl pleasure of pastoring. I love pastoring. I love people. I've had some of the greatest friends in the world because of being their pastor. I'm so grateful for that. Now, from now until the meeting's over, let's make this a matter of prayer. Let's bow in prayer.